Okay. Um, hi and welcome. I hope you can see my slides. Um, okay. Um, so my name is Adam Slabon from Stockholm University, and together with my colleagues Schubig Das from the Antwerp University and Robert Franke from the Leibniz Institute for Catalysis, we welcome you to the ninth edition of the Sustainable Chemistry Lecture Series in Europe. We are a <coughs> official UCAMS event. Our partners are also the University of Antwerpen, Stockholm University, uh, the University of Rostock, ACT Research from Austria, the LICAT, and KVCV. Today, we have again two fantastic guest speakers. In the first session, we will have a talk by Professor Katalin Barta from the University of Graz. This session will be chaired by Schubig. And the second talk will be by Professor Siegfried Waldvogel from the University of Mainz in Germany. And this session will be chaired by Robert Franke. I also would like to thank Thomas Franken for uh, the organization of this event. And one more slide as a, a spoiler for the next event, the 10th event, the titles and the time will still be decided, but I can tell you so far that we will have two guest speakers again, Professor Lucia Curry from the University of Bari in Italy and Professor Bert Sales from the University of Leuven in Belgium. With this, I will stop sharing my screen and I give over the word to Schubig and let's see. And I'm looking forward to see the talks. Schubig, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Thank you very much for the initial introduction of our ninth event. So our first speaker for this event is Professor Katalin Bata from University of Graz. And as usual, we start with a brief introduction of our speaker. So Katalin has carried out her master's research in the area of alternative solvents in catalysis at in Budapest, Hungary, and at Leeds University. She earned her PhD in 2008 at RWTH Aachen in Germany under the supervision of Professor Walter Leitner. She moved later to the research group of Professor Peter Ford at University of California, Santa Barbara, to do her postdoctoral research in the topic of renewable resources with homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts. After then, she became associate research scientist at the Center for Green Chemistry at Yale University and worked with Professor Paul Anastas, who is very well known in green chemistry. In 2013, she joined as a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Groningen. And in 2017, she was promoted to associate professor. And in 2019, she has moved to the University of Graz in Austria. It's quite obvious that her Exciting chemistry has earned a lot of awards, a lot of uh, respects. So for say, she is the representative of the UCAM SOC division in green chemistry. She is the member of the EU and national networks, Subicat ITN, European network on lignin valorization, Catch Bio national network on valorization of renewables and was associated member of SENSARF at UCSB. She is the recipient of the ERC starting grant and the talent scheme VD grant of NWO. Kathleen also received the Netherlands Catalysis and Chemistry Conference Award from NCCC. With this, Kathleen, I would like to invite you to share your chemistry and the screen is yours. Thank you, Shubik, and thank you, Robert and Adam, and thank you all of you for organizing these uh, nice, really nice events. Actually, it's a series of events which we really enjoy. So thank you so much for that, and particular pleasure that I am today. I believe I need to steal my screen, which I will do in just a second. I hope it works. Give me a heads up that. It's all yeah. fine, yes? yes so I will just uh, try to go on then with the presentation. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present this uh, research um, with you. This is mainly actually the topic of my, as you mentioned, uh, the ERC starting grant that I received in 2015. And um, there was a, a proposition there um, about how to better valorize lignocellulosic biomass. That that time it was not that obvious. And I believe we made uh, 
um, and other groups, of course, made a lot of progress in this area. And I would like to just show you the main philosophy of how we approach the problem and a little bit on uh, the works that we have carried out. Not everything, it's a selection, really. So the title of the talk is actually Cleveland Couple. And I think this really is, uh, very nicely summarizes our approach, how we deal with the uh, complexity that is present in renewable resources. And what you see on this slide here is on, on the picture here is actually the it's a representation of a lignin molecule. As you know, there is uh, millions of different lignin molecules and uh, the diversity of these structures is enormous. So this is really an artist <laughs> representation of a lignin molecule, which and I believe it reflects also, I mean, for me, it's always a beautiful structure. So it kind of inspires uh, uh, us to develop better chemistry. And I think this is the take home message also of my talk, how to get inspiration of this structure diversity of these molecules and and how to how to design better chemistry and more sustainable processes related to this complexity actually which is normally a problem but we try to take it as an inspiration so um, I think already this the screen is okay I think we already have a frozen screen here <laughs> Mm, just again, I will just. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you can still hear me, right? But the slides yes. are not moving, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to. Maybe Catalin, you escape and then you restart. Yeah, I did. I I try. Yeah, but it's it's uh huh. I tr I restart now. And then now, if you reshare. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I will. Mm -hmm. Sorry for that. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. It's I think we, we have. Okay, I will try to put it in the presentation and I see what happens. So this was the first slide. Okay, we almost got through that. Uh, second slide is wonderful, it works. So um, this is a, in a nutshell our research program, um, as I said, inspired and also focusing at the moment mainly on the lignocellulosic biomass. Um, we are, we, are, we try to uh, cover a number of catalytic disciplines, as you see here, and really the focus is the development of green and sustainable processes. Um, so with all the you know nice um, benefits of these processes, so we really try to look into how to gain a more atom efficient, uh, um, atom energy efficient uh, um, processes, if possible, in incorporate alternative solvents uh, and also abundant metals. So uh, what, I, what is, I, I think, also a bit unique uh, for our group and that we really take care of the whole value chain. So we try to use the raw lignocellulose and we try really hard to end up with something, you know, really concrete as a product. And I will hopefully be able to show you some examples on this in this talk. And the, the main philosophy, as I mentioned, in this cleave and couple approach is really driven by the idea that we, we set on the research questions, we set the boundary conditions of our molecular design, as, as Paul Anastas would say, so that we that we seek a, a completely sustainable process. I know it's a, it's of course a, a, an idea to reach, but we try we try to reach it. So we, we really try to maximize the sustainability of our process. So this would be in this in this green bracket here, and and I think the renewables, the complexity of renewables, really offers a, an excellent opportunity to do this because we can try to harness the structural diversity and try to seek the shortest route to a value, uh, value added product, which actually if we would make this product from let's say fossil resources, via bulk chemicals, then we would in some cases need several reaction steps to be able to do that, to, to achieve this. And quite frequently, this is associated with the production of waste, for example, for fine chemicals or pharmaceuticals. And here uh, we think that we can get there in a much better, much faster way. And that would be the, the idea here in this cleave and couple approach. And so how to have to get, de define or design these short routes is basically uh, two main steps we have to take care of the cleave and couple. The cleave is there really, mm, and the, you know, we, we call it basically uh, when we have to 
deal with the raw materials. So basically the depolymerization of some of these raw materials, not, it's not always depolymerization, of course, but for the sake of, um, you know, platform chemicals, let's, let's, for today, let's talk about like depolymerization of both cellulose and lignin uh, to get to get to some kind of platform chemicals. This seems obvious, but I have to say that um, I think it's very important to understand that there is a fine balance between the cleave and couple um, step in order to get to the final product that we want. And you know, when we started and when other groups have started, we didn't really know exactly what we will have here in this platform chemical stage. So yeah, of course, the first proposals were like, okay, we get like phenol from lignin or, or something very simple, but actually that does, did not turn out to be true. And we, we were looking for years for actually really concrete platform chemicals from lignin. So for, from cellulose, this was rather obvious, but from lignin, this wasn't so obvious. So the, the, the message that I would like to put forward here is that it is a fine balance because research in this step drives also the research in this step. So we, we have to try to adapt to the, you know, the coupling to the cleaving approach, but also uh, sometimes it's the other way around. If we want to get something really interesting on the product side that we might try to tune the cleave step here. So it's an iterative approach is what I wanted to say. And here, what is important, and now I think it's the state of the art is that when we do the fractionation and depolymerization of the raw material, of course, we have to take a holistic approach. So we have to make sure that both the cellulose and the lignin uh, are uh, the, the quality of these, uh, of these constituents is maintained essentially. So, so we cannot lose the quality of lignin on the expense of the cellulose and the other way around is, is the, I think, the really the established state of the art in this field now. Uh, for the coupling approach, I just want to mention that, of course, since biomass is so highly oxygenated, and this was also a little bit the topic of my ERC to, to focus on the amines, actually, uh, since biomass is so highly oxygenated, an obvious uh, coupling step would be to add, to add heteroatoms in a very efficient manner. So um, that's on that. And of course, on the product side, I think this will be the next five years in this, in this uh, field to try to understand, can we make something really useful out of these materials? And here, of course, um, emerging products are uh, very interesting because here we have the po possibility not, not only design sustainable processes, but also incorporate into the sort of molecular design better properties of products, so, so for example, uh, degradable polymers or, or um, you know, um, non-toxic materials and so on and so on. So there is a lot of interesting avenues here to explore. So in terms of the depolymerization, I would like to start with something very fundamental, which is again now, uh, I think, an established uh, a very important subject in the field. And that is, I think most of you already know about this uh, lignin first approaches. What does it mean? How do we, uh, how do we ensure that both the cellulose and the lignin um, constituents are maintained in quality uh, when we try to depolymerize lignocellulose? Then uh, there is a very simple, of course, um, uh, concept or theory that and observation, of course, and that that has been around for, for years and years. And that is, of course, related to um, uh, processes where we try to actually uh, pulp, for example, lignocellulosic biomass. And what you see here is actually the behavior of the lignin uh, under those conditions. And you can, for example, take organ, organosol pulping. You have organos, organic solvent, you have an acid, and then you start pulping lign lignocellulose. And what happens with the lignin is actually um, quite um, interesting and, and um, quite substantial, I would say. So here you, you have the beta of for linkage, which is a very well-known moiety in the lignin. You can see it in, in many, many publications. So here, uh, this, this alpha position here, this, this uh, secondary alcohol moiety is very prone for dehydration. So this uh, will, um, upon acid um, attack, it will basically form this benzylium ion, this benzylic carbonium uh, species, which actually this, this species is quite stabilized also due to the nature of the, of the, of the lignin and the quite electron donating substituents on the lignin and the, the possibility for delocalization here. So this is a resonance stabilized carbonium ion basically. So it, it, this is kind of around for quite some time and it can accept um, uh, nucleophiles from either intra or intermolecularly. So what happens is actually that you form, um, you quite frequently you have an aromatic ring which is attacking on this position and you will form this kind of 
um, carbon-carbon bonded structures, which are actually then quite stable. So when you hear about lignin is very hard to depolymerize, actually the problem is not even the native lignin structure, but is actually this carbon-carbon bond fo um, uh, formed uh, lignin, recalcitrant lignin structure that we talk about. And, and this is readily happening. This process is quite often happening in, in any kind of pulping process. The more you want to get your cellulose out, the, the means the more you pulp, the harsher processing conditions you use, the more acid you use, the more this process will happen. And of course, then the less um, uh, quality your lignin will have. So basically this carbon-carbon bonds, this is kind of impossible to cleave any, any longer. So um, um, lignin first approaches basically recognize that uh, we have to do something with the, with, the, with the tendency of lignin to form this carbon-carbon bond linkage. So essentially we have to stabilize at some point in along the way, so especially in this benzylium uh, ion. Uh, so it, this, has to be, this has to be really stabilized before the depolymerization or during the depolymerization process. And we also contributed to this, to this field. I show you two, two of these uh, possibilities of, depolymer, uh, of, of stabilization. One of them would be, and this is pioneered by many groups actually, the, on the next speaker, Ben's bad cells. Uh, I heard, I heard uh, Subic say that uh, he will talk in the next event and so this also was pioneered by the cells group and by others as well. So for example, using hydrogen or hydrogen donors uh, during the polymerization process. So if you, if you have here um, these, uh, these species here, so then if you add hydrogen donors or hydrogen, then you would um, basically reduce unsaturated intermediates that are forming and that are basically condensing to, to char. So this would be, uh, a one way of stabilization. The other way of stabilization would be to use diodes. I will talk to you about this in, uh, in more detail. So basically today I would like to first talk about uh, some of these hydrogen donor uh, mediated stabilization approaches when you using lignocellulose and how to get to some kind of products from this. And then uh, briefly also about diode stabilization approaches. So I would like to start with the hydrogen stabilization approach, as uh, you, I, I just showed before. So these are the, this is the scheme that I showed you before, and what happens is that this is actually quite quite complex. Here are the groups that have really pioneered this approach. So you have Roberto Rinaldi, Bad Cells, you have uh, Madi Abomar, you have also Joseph Samek. So many many groups here that were uh, you know uh, quite at, around the same time pioneering this approach, and so. Um, what, what was observed that during uh, lignocellulose fractionation or pulping, when a heterogeneous catalyst is, is added, catalyst is added into the mixture, uh, in situ stabilization with hydrogen or hydrogen donor will lead to much, much better yield of aromatic monomers from the lignocellulose directly. So it's essentially not getting the lignin out first and then depolymerizing, for example, via this catalyst, but adding the catalyst into the pulping process directly. So you have lignocellulose here, you add your catalyst, you add your hydrogen, you add your organic solvent, and you get your cellulose out, you get your catalyst also out, if it's a heterogeneous catalyst, which is usually is, and you get an oil which is very rich in aromatic monomers. So this is a very, very nice uh, approach. In fact, this is the highest yielding approach for aromatic monomers to, to get out of lignocellulose directly. Usually it's ethyl, or sometimes it's ethanol or propanol aromatics that that we can get out of of this of this species uh, of these uh, processes. And uh, I would like to show you our approach. Uh, so we also have contributed to this in, in a way. And uh, specifically, we have used porous metal oxides to carry out a number of transformations related to reductive chemistry. I just want to show you here this very, uh, let's say, uh, summary slide. We have we have a keen interest in these materials. These are very, very nice materials. I actually picked up some of this knowledge in, a, in a Santa Barbara when a Peter Ford's group was uh, as an inorganic chemistry group interested in these materials. So these are double layered uh, hydrotalcides, are double layered um, minerals. What is nice about them is what I usually say and what we usually joke about is this is a perfect undergraduate uh, research, a bachelor thesis project, for example. And we have, those for those of you who teach, 
I can really say that this is true. So we have a bachelor thesis, for example, and uh, we let the people uh, make their own composition because the point is that these structures are very tunable. So you can um, uh, incorporate a number of uh, transition metals into these structures. So we may have the bachelor student make a structure and not unfrequently, they find some very nice catalysts. So for example, this copper 10, nickel 10 PMO was found by a Brazilian exchange student who, who came to our group, not knowing anything about catalysts. She was so amazing and she picked up so much uh, knowledge. And in the end, she ended up being second author on this, on this paper because she found this unique composition. The, the point being, these are very interesting materials and the properties of the catalyst can be tuned very nicely by just uh, adding appropriate amounts of, uh, of transition metals as dopants to the structure. These are also basic in nature. They can also, of basicity acidity can also vary, of course, and that is very interesting uh, for if we talk about renewable resources and uh, some transformations related to that. I just want to point out this uh, scheme here, which is, um, this is, was the first time I got introduced to this, to this um, porous metal oxides. This was using supercritical methanol in, in the presence of copper 20 PMO, so 20% copper dope porous metal oxide consisting of magnesium and aluminum next to it. Uh, and we, what we have here is supercritical methanol. We have methanol reforming going on, which is making part, a part of the methanol, uh, part of the methanol is, is undergoing methanol reforming, producing hydrogen. So this hydrogen is used then for the depolymerization of raw lignocellulose. This was very early work, and it was a, like an amazing um, way to enter this topic, I would say, because this was my first experiment as, my, as a postdoc. I just put in the wood chips in the reactor and, and then put on methanol and put on this very cheap catalyst. I closed the reactor, heat it up to 300 degrees of Celsius, opened in two hours or four hours, and the wood was gone. It was completely gone. It was like amazing. And the whole wood was like kind of dissolved and processed into aliphatic alcohols, basically. And the catalyst was left behind without any char formation. So this was what we later dubbed as UCSB process. We have this accounts article if you're interested about this story here. But why I talked about this is because we wanted now to implement, uh, I wanted to implement a lignin a hybrid lignin first, let's say, based on this copper dope porous metal oxide. And what, uh, what we wanted to do here is to have a two-step process in which we take full advantage of the idea of the lignin first process, which would be here. So basically a mild step to get aromatic monomers out of lignin from the lignocellulose. And then obviously we have a cellulose and a catalyst, which, is, which are solid, both solid. So they are mixed together. So we wanted to insert this next step here, this, this porous metal oxide plus supercritical methanol treatment. And this in order to, to get rid of all of the processed solids. So basically all of the cellulose and all of the unreacted lignin and everything which was here should go away. It should be processed into methanol soluble materials essentially. And the idea was that if we do this, then the catalyst is left behind and no organics. We can just filter it. We can just filter it and reintroduce it back to the process. So this was in a way, um, one way of, let's say, catalyst recycling into the, into the system. So um, we were interested to understand whether this is even possible to do. And when we do it, we have from lignin, we have some kind of aromatics and from cellulose, we will have also some kind of intermediates. And of course, uh, ideally speaking, this works and the recycling works as well. So how it looks is actually like this. So you have see, you see the wood chips here, you see the copper dope porous metal oxide, which this catalyst, they don't contain any noble metals, so that, that they are quite nice for us. So first step was the first big surprise that we had because that time when we observed this, we understood that we have a huge selectivity to this 1G, we call it, uh, propanol guayacol, basically. So we have about 90% selectivity to this one single compound. So you can imagine the GCFID looks like one, one peak, which is quite, quite nice for lignin chemistry. So then we have this kind of um, uh, solids that are left behind. And when we add methanol and heat it up, what we observe is really, really 
the catalyst residues remaining and aliphatic alcohols being formed. Then we can, we can do this uh, re or recycling quite for some time. So this kind of um, eventually declines, the catalyst activity declines. And the, the reason is not leaching, as we understand at the moment. The reason is magnesium aggregation and uh, copper aggregation, aluminum aggregation mainly in the catalyst. So in a very picture, uh, um, in a cartoony fashion, let's say, um, we call this uh, lignoflex, it's a flexible use of copper top porous metal oxides. This was really done by an excellent PhD student uh, who is now a professor in China. So basically, uh, why I love this slide is because it really nicely demonstrates the, what I wanted to do with my ERC starting grant is that we have intermediates that are actually alcohols, which you can see here, this is beautiful that we manage to maintain this primary alcohol function, which was not trivial at that time. So that was really the highest selectivity to that. And that is important for us because we want to use it for the coupling. And the, uh, on the other hand uh, here, so um, the second step delivers some aliphatic alcohols. This is a bit more complex mixture, but we wanted to see what we can do with it. So um, also I want to mention that Normally, in the classical manner, what you have is cellulose go to bioethanol, which is a one compound, and lignin goes to a mixture of compounds. And here we have a, a process which is kind of a reverse. We have lignin going into this one aromatic alcohol, which can be isolated very easily. And cellulose is the one who's going now with two, two aliphatic alcohols. It's not ethanol, but with we we have some higher carbon chains, let's say, and we thought it's interesting. So alcohols and alcohols, and what we can we do with it? How to design the coupling strategies? So here, since this is a mixture, what we wanted to do is we wanted to diverge, converge the composition of this to um, cyclic alkanes that could be used as a let's say jet fuel range alkanes. I don't want to go into detail here, but what I want to mention is that this copper nickel composition of uh, porous metal oxide and no other catalyst, this copper nickel composition was the one who gave really superior uh, selectivities in uh, designing uh, this coupling step. So it was actually a dehydrogenation, coupling, aldoconization and hydrogenation step to get to the cyclic ketones, which then a deep hydrodeoxygenation gets to these alkanes. And in this stage, we can actually properly quantify these, these mixtures and about 60%, or 50 to 60% uh, carbon uh, mass balance we, we managed to get. Some of these alcohols you see here, these are not coupling, but the rest very nicely, readily coupled with cyclopentanol. I want to focus more on the valorization of these aromatic alcohols, which is here. And since it's a, now a one single compound, we, we proposed, okay, this is a lignin derived platform chemical, even though, as you can see, this is actually quite sad because, I mean, what would you like to do from this molecule? I mean, we have to think about really like, what can we access that is actually useful for us? So this would be a one platform chemical that we, we propose. And so what we first wanted to do, of course, is to, to, to demonstrate that since it's a platform chemical, we can actually convert it to something useful. So we are describing this paper about like about 20 or 25 value-added compounds from this, from this uh, aromatic building block. I just want to show you a, um, just a, a few um, basically, yeah, pathways or and applications. So what, what worked quite nicely was um, uh, essentially, uh, uh, yeah, deoxygenation on, on this side uh, to to potentially get to bisphenols. Here, bisphenols as well. Uh, you could um, you could also access functionalized polystyrenes or bisphenols here as well via a metathesis pathway. In here, what I want to mention is that. Of course, first idea we, or first wish we had is that this is a primary alcohol. We would like to couple it directly with ammonia. And then we would like to get to this primary amine here, and that might be useful for us. But that reaction was actually quite difficult. And one of the reasons was this presence of this phenol here. So this is, again, an example of 
difficulties that you face with bio-derived substances that uh, sometimes trivial reactions are not so trivial because you have multiple oxygenated functions and multiple functionalities that might actually influence your catalysis. So here it was not so trivial. What we managed to do is to get to this nitrile in a selective manner. And this nitrile could be practically 99% hydrogenated to the, to the amine. And also it could be yeah, hydrolyzed to the acid, the acid could be turned to bisphenols, the acid undergoes also oxidative decarboxylation to the styrene, which undergoes meta undergoes metathesis to this bisphenol here, to the styrene, still being derivative, and also it could be used for functionalized polystyrenes. So this was the first attempt that we that we have um, investigated. There were some others uh, that involved the of course, the phenol to aniline transformations and the uh, 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 transformations on the aromatic ring. I don't show these at the moment. And of course, um, I just want to make a little detour here. Uh, I'm looking at the time also, we have a, a couple of minutes more. So um, a little detour is essentially, we of course had a keen interest also in uh, borrowing hydrogen methodologies, because as you see here, there's so much, and this is by no means a, a reaction equation, it's just an illustration that, you know, we can imagine a lot of um, alcohols from biomass coming, and so if we manage to get nailed this down, essentially this um, and uh, amination of alcohol and alkylation of amines uh, by a homogeneous catalyst or a heterogeneous catalyst um, in, a, in a, let's say, hydrogen borrowing fashion, where you have the dehydrogenation of this alcohol to the corresponding aldehyde, which undergoes um, the um, basically the imine formation, and then the imine is rehydrogenated to the amine, then basically we have a hydrogen given, a hydrogen taken hydrogen given, and you have, uh, high, let's say, um, uh, a secondary amine, uh, which in a very, very efficient manner. And of course, there are many, many pioneering pioneering groups uh, in this field. And we, we looked up to these groups, of course, and we, we uh, tried to understand what we can contribute. But basically, uh, what, what we managed to do is um, uh, an iron catalyzed uh, method here, uh, quite broad, uh, scope iron catalyzed method here. This was also collaboration with Ben Feringa. Um, it, it was using basically nucleus complex to do this. Uh, we had some heterogeneous and, and also nanoparticle chemistry that was doing a pretty good job in some of these transformations here. What I want to mention in particular is this situation, and this was done both with nucleus complex and also Schwarz catalyst. Uh, there seemed to be a, a gap which we have realized. And this is also related to re renewable resources, not so much or to lignin chemistry, but basically you see here is an uh, unprotected amino acid. And when we, we were dealing with this homogeneous catalyst uh, um, methodologies, really, it was not so much comp catalyst development, but methodology development, we realized that there is not so many methods that can do um, an alkylation of an unprotected alpha amino acid. And we, we searched, and this was Tao Yan, also very, uh, my first PhD student, actually, excellent, excellent PhD student, who was really um, working very hard to, to establish this method. But basically, um, it works with Shaw's catalyst excellently. So we didn't expect this. We thought there, is a, there will be a lot of side reactions and chelations, but to, uh, picking the right solvent, picking the right method is we are able to do a very selective enalkylation of a number of amino acids. And what was very interesting is with nucleus complex and Schwarz catalyst, you don't have the need to use a base. So basically these are base-free methods, which means that we also maintain the you know, chiral information that is provided by nature. And why is this interesting? For a number of reasons, we can, for example, change or modify the N-terminus of simple peptides. And we can just take a, a simple diol, and you can just click on a diol in a monoalkylated or dialkylated fashion. You can also click on an, a fatty alcohol. And then we have a completely different property for a simple peptide, for example. So it's quite interesting, I think. And what was very interesting for us is to understand that if we take a natural amino acid and a fatty alcohol of a, a certain range, let's say it works from 8, 9, 10, even 12, and even higher, 
solubility is a problem, of course, but we, if we manage to overcome, then it's a number of, we will manage to get a number of uh, cases where we can have, you see, this is a kind of foaming situation, so we can get sustainable surfactants, and these are amphoteric surfactants, so these are actually quite interesting class of surfactants, by simply using about like one more percent Schwarz catalyst in some case. But even some case, nucleus complex is able to do the job, so it's basically, you have a nature-derived amino acid, a, a potentially nature-derived fatty alcohol. You can see on, on this side also, for example, this can be a fatty, al uh, fatty acid-based alcohol, and, and you can use a, an amino acid here, for example, glycine, and uh, the catalyst is doing your job and immediately getting you the surfactant. Here, the beauty was that we could get a very selective mono and alkylation in this case, and these surfactants are yeah, quite good properties. We also patented this process. And the, the backstory, I mean, it was highlighted I, to my surprise in chemical engineering and news, but um, they, I could, they, they made this scheme. I, I didn't do this scheme, but basically um, um, it, it's a nice uh, story to think about is like uh, really what we do and how we do surfactants at the moment is really still via, you know, ammonia, and that comes from the Haber-Bosch process. And then ammonia is, you know, various ways alkylated and and uh, either high temperature with the uh, um, alcohols or or even still, and and alkyl halides are being used. And even for these surfactants that are being manufactured, as I understand, uh, talking about uh, about these issues with some of these companies really purification is an a, a, a issue because because still some alkyl halides are being used for these processes. So then you have the halogenide that you have to take care of it and it's forming. So it's not so trivial actually. And so so this is actually a clean way to get to these surfactants. And uh, yeah, here of course, nitrogen fixation is being done by a microorganism and that is producing the amino acid. The amino acid is in one step alkylated. So that's the, that would be the, the idea here. Then what is also, I, I really think is quite uh, nice and interesting to, to think about and uh, is this. So we here we have an unprotected amino acid to an alkylate, let's say, and this, this is the work I showed you before. And then we thought, okay, something very similar would be, let's say take a beta uh, hydroxy acid or hydroxy ester. And can we then aminate a pretty much the same method to get to this pretty much beta amino acid? In this case, it would be artificial structures or non-natural structures, but still the diversity of this would be quite huge. And beta amino acids, of course, are very important moieties. And this was Anastasia Afanesenko already in Canada doing her postdoc and a very nice work from her. So basically we, it's a long story, but to take it short, we managed to um, perform or develop a quite a, a general method for the amination of beta hydroxy esters. Alpha was not working as well. Uh, beta was working very nicely. And we think is via cooperative catalysis, um, we, have, we have to use about 5 more percent brush acid additive, this, this particular additive. And in that case, we have really almost full selectivity and, and very nice uh, yeah clean reaction in other ways we we the reaction is not not good and you can imagine there are lots of side reaction in here so really the British acid additive was very very helpful in this case we did some nmr um, studies uh, to confirm this as well uh, why i'm telling you this in relation to renewables though you can see in this I, and why I think it's actually quite nice is because we know this compound, this is a top platform chemical from the actually many different raw materials. So this is hydro, uh, hydroxy uh, propionic acid and esters. So this can be obtained from glucose and glucose can be obtained from lignocellulose, from cellulose, from starch. So you name it, a lot of raw materials. And this process to get to HPE is basically already established industrially. So this method is really kind of bridging the gap between this compound and basically a bio-based beta amino acid esters, which we think is important, 
And this could be directly used for a number of, basically we add nitrogen, but and we add nitrogen in a, a very selective fashion so that we maintain some of these quite uh, uh, valuable structural moieties here. What is nice is that it, this HP can also be obtained from basically glycerol waste. So it, it's, a, it's a, I think, a quite valuable step to, to make and from HPA we man managed to obtain all of these uh, all of these I mean um, basically beta amino acid ester derivatives here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all my talk, but I think I just would like to show you as this as a last example. And this was basically going, coming back to the lignin depolymerization, but taking some of this hydrogen borrowing with us. So as I mentioned here, we used Shaw's catalyst and here we used also Shaw's catalyst mainly. So this was an amazing catalyst for us, a base-free method for us. And we realized that we could use um, in the presence of phenol, and it's similar to an unprotected amino, unprotected amino acid that the catalyst should be right, quite robust towards these functional groups, that we could maybe use this method also to uh, try to manipulate some of these lignin-derived platform chemicals. And as you see here, so normally, if we have such a functionalized platform chemical, then yeah, I mean, it's true that we can, we should develop methods to go to bulk chemicals. In this case, however, we lose quite a lot of carbon atoms and oxygen atoms to do that. Uh, yeah, this is also important, of course, but what we wanted to do here is along the lines of this cleave and couple concept is that we would like to really maintain all of the functionality that is in the molecule, a particular headache was this, of course, this propyl chain, because it's kind of useless. And we, we thought we want to make use of it, but real use of it. And one way to use it really nicely is to involve it in a seven member ring, for example. And so, which contains a nitrogen even better. And if you see here that this is basically tetrahydrotabenzazepines, so these molecules are very useful. And these are, you see, if uh, we looked at all these medicinal chemistry papers, you know, and, and this was 70s, 80s, very nice organic chemistry, but really quite, quite a lot of steps, quite, quite a lot of side products, quite a lot of chlorinated solvents that are being used for the synthesis of these molecules. So we thought, mm -hmm, this would be nice. So we can click on the nitrogen and then close the ring somehow. And then we could get to our, let's say, biologically active compounds. So uh, to make a long story short, basically we managed to do a perfectly selective enalkylation which shows catalyst, D does not matter for the phenol, is, doesn't care about the phenol. And it's very selective to the secondary amine. And secondary amine is what we need here. And we do it with a quite a good scope here. And I just want to comment why a quite a good scope is important because if we aim for biologically active molecules, this essentially if we want to branch into this, uh, let's say, uh, testing or or you know evaluating of biological activities, then uh, doing assays and doing you know generating different structures uh, in a very simple way is actually quite important. So here we have a lot of different compounds. And, and I'm going to skip this. And what is then still important is, of course, that we can close the ring. And this was, again, something that is uh, that was taking us more than one year to, to actually sort it out. So this, this would be a pictet spangler cyclization using a formaldehyde to, to get to this seven-member heterocycle. And the problem was that any conventional method that we picked, actually, they are not very nice. So they're sometimes quite harsh, using quite acidic conditions, quite a lot of halogenated organic solvents. So we were not particularly happy about this step. And the more imp most problem was that actually there was, a, of course, a, an, um, an methylation of the, of the of nitrogen. So it, it wasn't very selective. So we almost gave up. Then we had uh, an, uh, the idea that we could use also deep eutectic solvents. So for example, some choline chloride oxalic acid based deep eutectic solvents, which have been already demonstrated for 
manic reactions, for, for immune formations, for, for some of these cyclization reactions, not particularly in this one, but, but for some others. And so we, we thought that we need a, this, is, this would be a good solvent. It's highly ionic in nature. It would stabilize ionic intermediates. It would provide strong hydrogen don, bond donor properties for the activation of the, of the carbon oxygen bond that is needed for the immune ion formation. So basically that would facilitate the cyclization step. And that was the case, luckily indeed. So what we could do is we could make a bunch of these molecules in a, in a, in a very nice and beautiful way. So we can have in some cases very high, 91, for example. Uh, these are all isolated yields. So this was actually quite a nice reaction to do. So what we, in, in a sense, have um, is kind of coming back to the yeah, initial, the first slide of my talk, is that we have raw material, we can have a, a few steps, let's say, to get to a molecule which is, which is normally obtained from bulk chemicals with quite quite, um, you know, when we looked it up, it's like it can be more than 10 steps to, to synthetically obtain this, this molecule from simple aromatics. And so here, what we have is one step to get to the to the uh, this one G, so pro propanol guayaco compound, and one step to get to the amin selective amination, and one step of selective cyclization. In here, we use CPME. Here, we use deep eutectic solvent, but this is potentially recyclable, and no other additive, no other harsh acid, nothing else. This works like a charm. And of course, the bonus is that. Uh, and that's really my, my last point here, that we tested these molecules, these libraries of molecules uh, in collaboration with Anna Hirsch at the Helmholtz Institute of Pharmaceutical Research. And they appeared, actually they were quite positive. So they appeared um, for, the, for the fact that we, it was the first testing and the no structural optimization, they were actually promising hits um, uh, for a number of um, uh, endpoints, for example, anti-infective uh, um, against gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria, and also showed some anti-cancer activities. So here, a highlight in the um, ACS Central Science about this work of Jeremy Luther Barker. They, they wrote this nice, uh, in, yeah, opinion about, about this. So basically, it just shows that it, we, we have to have such approaches also when we talk about a holistic lignocellulosic biorefinery scheme, because we can make the bulk chemicals, we can make phenol, we can make a different type of molecules. But if we then also make some, some of these fine chemical structures, at least from a portion of these aromatics, then it will definitely increase the profitability of of uh, of our re lignocellulose refining of the biorefinery in general, so this would be the the my message. And as a last point, also I would like to mention is that um, many many bioactive molecules are being synthesized from lignin, and they come this biosynthetic part uh, from not from lignin from the amino acids that lignin is also made from. So these amino acids, uh, phen phenylalanine or tyrosine, they are used for the synthesis by nature of for bioactive molecules and also for the biosynthesis of lignin. So we think that these structural moieties that are in lignin, they are also then in bioactive molecules that they, they, we have a quite high chance to, to reach quite efficiently to some bioactive molecules from the lignin scaffold as well. And that was the case here with this testing. So we were quite pleased with that. And I would like to all skip all of these slides. And I really just would like to f find the, the last slide for thanking all my amazing groups, past and present, for these excellent uh, works. And thank you very much for the yeah for the this lecture. And I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Katalin. Thank you very much for the very nice overview of your lignin chemistry in your lab. We learned a lot, and uh, obviously the discussion or it's uh, sorry the the talk is now open for discussions. Uh, I do see two questions actually in the chat. Please uh, let me read the questions. The first question from Seri Budnaik. Thanks for very interesting talk indeed. Which analytical strategy you would advise for the characterization of lignin as a raw materials 
and for depolymerization products, especially with focusing on industrial implementation. Mm -hmm. And so, well, it, it depends, but but I well, I can I can answer it, and this is by no means a, a advertisement, but but I would like to mention that uh, uh, we a group of people that really uh, were uh, pioneering the lignin first approaches. And we had this energy environmental science paper in 2020, I believe. I hope I'm right with that. Um, so in that, that's called uh, guidelines for, for lignin first biorefining. And there, there is a, a, a big sec section about uh, the analytics as well. So these are kind of best practices, what you can do for characterization of starting material as well as product streams uh, if you do lignin first biorefining. So I, I would really advise to, to take a look into this paper in Energy Environmental Science 2020. A, a, a bunch of authors, Joseph Samek is one, one was one who drove this, uh, this initiative forward and Greg Beckham is on it. So quite a many, many authors really. It's about the best practices, establishing best practices in the field. But usually it's a, it's a, it's a combination of techniques. So it's a NMR, you have uh, for the products, you have GPC, you have GCMS, you have GCFID, uh, HPLC if you need it, it, it depends on the, on the, on the type of depolymerization technique that you are using. Uh, thank you, Catalin. So along the same line, actually, I have one very quick question. How do you separate? Because normally when you are depolymerizing the lignin molecule, of course, or let's say lignocellulose, you'll get a lot of these aliphatic alcohols or aromatic things. How do you separate them? Yeah, you know, I, I think you, you touched upon a very important subject because uh, uh, I think this will be the next five years again. I think we will see a lot of interesting uh, research coming from these angles. So I think people experiment with membrane separations. That there is, uh, you know, we we try to avoid columns. Also, I tell my group. So we we, for example, when we have what I showed you here with this ninety. 1% selectivity, we just, we want to just decant the, the bio oil and you basically have the, the, the almost very high purity. So we don't do any, any separation. So we just go on to the next step. So that is, that is possible sometimes. Sometimes it's not possible. Uh, I can just show you here. So here, for example, for these bioactive molecules, what we did specifically, I told the guys, I don't want to see any separation. I don't want to see any column. I want to see something simple. Ideally, we want to see something on a, uh, in, a, in a way that it's here. So maybe you can see it. Maybe I still share it. So here, what you what you see, there is a depolymerization step. So you have a mixture of things. You 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 remove the solids by filtration, and you basically, yeah. Um, here you add the reagent and the catalyst into the crude, and you you get to the amine, and then you separate out the amine. So my idea was actually here. I want I told but the postdoc please crystallize me the, the compound or, or just precipitate. I don't want to see any, any other uh, purification, but okay, I have to admit, so it wasn't possible. So here we still use the column to get this, to, this, to this. I mean, but the idea would be to, you know, to minimize a purification effort. And in some cases, what you see, especially for the lignin first approaches where you get to a propyl or ethyl aromatics that you do some kind of uh, advanced distillation methods, for example, like industrial um, scale you will do. And with other projects, we do that too. So we have a fractional distillation, for example, to get to different fractions or even pure compounds. But it's a very, very important question. I mean, separation we have to, we have to address. There are some very new approaches also. Alternative solvents can be used, um, even deep eutetic solvents and uh, ionic liquids, all this, yeah. Thanks, Kathleen. There is one more question from Joseph Samek. You already made it. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk, Kathleen. Uh, what happened when you oxidized the propanol guasi gu guas mm -hmm. sauce? Did you get the lignin? Yeah, 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 I want to, I just try to. Uh... So it's in the chat box. So mm -hmm. what happened when you oxidized the Propanol, guacol, <laughs> how do you say? Yeah, 
You you mean which method, Joseph? Joseph, can you please type? We, we, we did not get back the lignin. How is that possible? <laughs> okay, in the interest of time, probably we go to the next question. So the question from Rajini Kant Mahato. Thank you for this valuable talk. I just want to know that the catalysts used in this study are containing with cyclopentanyl environment. Is there any special role of this environment or another type of catalyst may able to do these transformations? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, of course, we would love to design some really nice uh, metal complexes and I, I cannot claim that we have managed to do that. So this is really, we are using um, some of those very special complexes that we all know that they are, they are like so special that we can study them for more years. And there are of course many, uh, yeah, many papers already about the activity of these spe specific complexes, the Schwarz catalyst and the nucleus complex, why they behave in a way they behave and why they are able to do dehydrogenation or why they are able to do such a good uh, hydrogen transfer activity, of course. Uh, so it's a very special cases, yeah. And Catalin, meanwhile, we have got reply back from Joseph. So, he mentioned that you had problems with oxidation of the propanol function in presence of the guaycol. Yeah, no, what I meant is that when we try to, for example, do a, a hydrogen borrowing approach from this 1G, let's say, so propanol guaycol, then uh, many of these methods actually use base. And that base really interferes with the phenol or, or the phenol has a bad effect on the base. So basically those methods don't work so well. And so we really wanted to have a base-free method also because of the presence of the phenol in the molecule. But it's also true that if we just want to, I can give you an example. If we want to take, um, um, yeah, Shannon Stahl's uh, copper tempo oxidation method to get to the, selectively get to from the primary alcohol to the aldehyde, this will not work because there is a phenol. So we have to protect the phenol in order to, in order to, to go on with the oxidation. So I think, and we did not then study quite extensively the other type of oxidation methods because we went on the dehydrogenation of this moiety. But I, I, I think oxidation will be quite a problem for the phenols. So if you, if you, investigate what happens on the on the on the propanol side if we apply some oxidation methods i think phenol will interfere quite quite well quite much with with those most of those methods yes there is another question in the chat box so thank you very from the, the question is from Aitor Bermejo. thank you so much for such a great talk regarding the inalkylation of amino acids or amino ester do you have any control on the selectively on the selectivity between mono or the dialkylated products? The answer is that there is some control on that. So it, it is the usual parameters. So sometimes when you when you prolongate the reaction time, uh, you, you, you will have the dialkylated product. But um, what is, and I think with the nucleus complex, it's a very high selectivity to the secondary amine, but I think it's because the catalyst eventually dies in the process, so it's not as active for the dialkylation process. So that, that is the reason. Uh, for the uh, 1G and for the very selective um, enalkylation of this, of this uh, um, yeah, propanol moiety, uh, we're still not sure how is, why is it such a high selectivity. We just observe that is always is, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Katal. And Mr. just one, one more comment yeah. because I want to answer properly. So for the HPA, so the, for the hydroxypropionic acid, uh, um, um, the, there we can control mono versus dialkylation just by the reaction time. And there we can push it to the dialkylation product completely. Thank you, Catalin. Is there any further questions? One I, uh, more question, Shubek, if I can. Adam, in. please. Yeah, thank you, Catalin, for this very inspiring talk. Uh, I was thinking, you mentioned the E-factors. Um, I mean, we know that the atom economy, if you kind of cleave lignin with hydrogen, is unity. But which E-factors are we talking about if you're thinking about the depolymerization of lignin? So what is like the benchmark <laughs> for this? 
Uh, that's also a very, very good question. I mean, the E factor, I mainly, I, I really mainly uh, mean about the downstream processing. So obviously, I, I show you some high, like fine chemicals, and there the um, the E factor is mainly also connected to the solvent used, to the number of reaction steps that is being used. So it's indirectly in the equation. So basically, uh, for example, in this case where we have the tetrahydrobenzazepines, uh, we analyze so we can look into, okay, this molecule, this specific molecule, if we get it from lignin, mm -hmm. how much solvent we use, how, 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 how do we calculate the metrics and we can attempt to calculate and in the supporting we did so, so we, we have the the extensive calculation there. So we find the same molecule and we find that uh, how is it with the classical synthesis. And what we find usually is that the, that is the number of reaction steps, the number of purification steps that's needed, and basically the solvent use that is pushing up the e factor. Are we like in the range of kind of the pharmaceutical industry or rather, because I mean, this is this is. is yeah, sorry. This is this is for the fine chemicals. Yeah, for lignin depolymerization, I, I don't I don't think it's uh, relevant. As I mean, of course, we will you will have to use uh, uh, some kind of reaction medium uh, to 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 perform these operations. But but I think this is a completely different subject. The the E factor in that sense, because yeah, and I mean there there it it would be calculated the energy. That is used, the solvent that is used for the for the depolymerization. There is certain uh, solvents that I don't think would be preferred over some other solvents in the biorefining as well. So there, of course, the type of solvent is. I think it would be very important. We have some subjects specifically on that to replace classical organic solvents for alternative solvents for the biorefining itself. For example, or or I mean, in there, but there, there, I think it's it's a different subject because there, of course, the main issue is that it has to be recycled. So it has to be recovered somehow. It it will be in a bigger amount, so we have to solve the whole, yeah, process. In uh, you know, it can just cannot just uh, accumulate it as an e factor, but you will have to essentially, yeah, recycle your solvent, in which you do the biorefining. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Is there any further questions? If we have a little bit more time, uh, yeah, yeah. Please, one bro. very last one. Um, so, yeah, so, no, was, please. so thank you also uh, for, for, for the very kind, uh, for, the, for the very uh, impressive talk. Um, so I was interested in this uh, copper doped catalyst, uh, PMO catalyst, which is also shown on, on, on the present slide. Um, can you share maybe a little bit of information on the nature of the active site, maybe the, the, what is known about the depolymerization mechanism and why is this catalyst so efficient compared to others? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's an excellent question, of course. And we try to we try to look really quite 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 some, not enough, of course, but what we tried. This this the answer is I think also yeah multifold because it depends. Okay, so for the mild depolymerization, where we talk about this step here, which is shown on the slide here, where, where you get the essentially the lignin first depolymerization, we do we did propose some you know some mechanism that would and we propose that it's a dehydrogenation and then um, hydrogenolysis and then the, the molecule is formed because we did some mechanistic studies, but I don't think that's completely true because here basically the unifying, um, yeah, sort of all the, the accepted, I don't know, I think the, I have to say state of the art discussion is that it is a solvolysis which is followed by a hydrogenation reaction which is delivering this compound here so there will be an unsaturated intermediate that is actually independent of the catalyst so that would be just hydrogenated so it's a it's a simple hydrogenation chemistry combination with we, because we don't know in which stage the fragments that are coming from lignin that these might be smaller fragments but still quite big and they, these should un undergo hydrogenolysis of the beta O4 linkage. So that would be a oxygen carbon bond cleavage directly. And in this catalyst specifically, these are quite good bifunctional catalysts. So they are good in providing hydrides and protons and because of the slightly basic side. So they have the magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide obviously plays a role in the 
exchange of the hydride and the, and the proton. So hydride is on the on the on the copper and the proton is on the on the other side of the molecule or the of the of the support, let's say. This is one. About the supercritical regime, that's a that's a mystery still. I mean, it, it's kind of like you know, it's a methanol reforming st step. Methanol reforming has been studied for thirty years, and you know there are some insights, but that is on zinc and this is on magnesium. So what's the difference? We need to do more research on that, I think. But we know that uh, the copper um, zero nanoparticles of the size between five and 15 play a role because we, we see them and the active catalyst does have them. We also see copper one, copper two and copper zero distributed in, in, the, in, the, in the solid. So we do have also copper one in there. And uh, we we start with the copper two, which is then you know uh, under those conditions is activated and um, well activated. It's it's kind of in situ reduced to some copper zero in which stage the the reaction goes. Mm -hmm. So we think the actual catalyst is taking place in copper zero, which is however surrounded with some kind of magnesium oxide, aluminium oxide, which are promoting the hydrogen shuttling. Mm -hmm. This is what we think, but yeah, we we need to look more. Thank you. Yeah, Kathleen, thank you very much for such an inspiring lecture, inspiring chemistry and very nice discussions. Thanks a lot. Thank now, you so much for the yeah. invitation. Thank you. Now actually I hand, hand over the screen to Robert. Okay, thank you Shobek. Thanks again, uh, Kathleen, for the very nice lecture. Uh, now uh, let's switch to our next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Siegfried Waldvogel, uh, who is currently a full professor in organic chemistry at uh, Mainz University here in Germany. I will uh, say a few words on his uh, CV. So Sigi received his um, master's degree or diploma, as we called it once in, in Germany, degree from the University of Constance uh, in the very south of Germany. Then he moved further north uh, to Mülheim, the beautiful city of Mülheim in the Ruhrpott area, uh, to carry out his PhD studies under supervision of Manfred Reetz uh, in the area of uh, transition metal catalysis and hydroformulations. And this was done at the Max Planck Institute for Coal Research. So then Ziggy moved to Southern California to work as a postdoc and a supramolecular, uh, supramolecular chemist in the group of Julia, Julius Rebeck uh, at the Scripps uh, Institute in La Jolla. Afterwards, he returned to Germany and started his uh, independent career at the University of Münster, uh, where he worked uh, on projects uh, centered around supramolecular receptors also, this uh, led to his habilitation. And during his habilitation time in Münster, this was probably 15 or 20 years ago, uh, Ziggy, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, he came in the first time in touch with uh, organic electrochemistry. And this was in the context of the Grandmaster uh, um, Hans Schäfer, who was at the time still active um, in this area. And uh, he tested some of his reactions in the electrochemical cell, which turned out to be quite successful. And this was the starting point uh, for, for a very fruitful electrochemical research program, uh, which we'll, we uh, will all be able to witness soon, I guess. Well, in the following years, Ziggy first moved to Bonn University, where he became associate professor. And this was the first time uh, I also uh, uh, met him as a very small student still. Then he moved to Mainz University to accept his current position as a full professor. And during these years, uh, Ziggy successfully continued uh, to develop his research projects in the areas of supramolecular sensing, coupling chemistry, conversion of renewables, and of course, electrosynthesis. And uh, in particular, this latter topic became recently very important, became, uh, came into the focus, and Ziggy is now one of the leading organo, uh, organic electrochemists worldwide. It should also be mentioned that he uh, uh, founded a company called Easy Labs, uh, which provides expertise and technologies uh, for electrosynthesis uh, from the gram to the ton scale. Uh, and uh, Ziggy's research was also acknowledged uh, with numerous awards. Uh, uh, some of them I'm, I can mention here. Very recently, he received the Manuel Beza Award of the Electrochemical Society, as well as the Novartis Chemistry Lecture Award. And a few years ago, also very important, the Har Jaroslav Hayrovsky Prize from the International Society of Electrochemistry. All right. Um, before the audience uh, becomes impatient, uh, we'll finish now with introduction and hand over to our speaker, Ziggy. Please, uh, the screen is yours. Yeah, I tried to share Ooh. my video, but the host blocked me, but it's okay. We, in the meantime, we are able to get to talk. See you guys. Uh, 
Okay, thanks uh, for the invitation to, oops, I'm afraid, yeah. Do you see the, the presentation? Yes. Yes, you should. Okay. No, no, for, the, for, for the invitation uh, to, to give a talk here. Um, and for, and um, in addition, um, thanks for the brilliant talk, uh, Katalin. Uh, um, for, for this purpose, I removed my um, stuff on, uh, on Lignin and uh, I will tell you some, some other stuff. Um, I think electrifying organic synthesis is something we should definitely come and I, I will talk about next level challenges as well. This um, here is more or less the the, uh, um, the, the, the slide goes tribute to, to, to Robert Franke. Um, the, but but the, I call this is the, the dark side of the of the green world more or less. And um, what, what you see here is that, that you have more and more switching off of um, coal and, and gas firing because of the climate change that this is very, very important. And some countries like, like ours also re, uh, will switch off the nuclear power plants. Um, we rely more and more on, on renewable uh, electricity resources, and these are not steady. That means we did, they did the supply and demand do not fit together. And you can think about a big battery. But the problem is you have such a large amount for heavy industry countries like Germany. Um, you cannot put this in, 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 in a battery. For, for, for Therefore, you need to generate more and the surplus you used to make valuable compounds. Um, we put this in, 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 in words a little bit in a different way with examples that you can already use that. Um, what can we do nowadays? And, and one thing that everybody is talking about synthetic fuels. Um, that's something you can do. You need a larger amount of electricity um, and, and you have large volumes and maybe there's not much bargain uh, out of it. Commodities will be a little bit more interesting at the moment uh, because you don't need so much electricity, but, but you definitely make something out of it and find chemicals. They immediately pay off. There are numerous examples now where you can use this even for pharmaceuticals. Um, here, the electricity demand is pretty low, but, uh, but the, the volume is small and therefore the investment is also rather low and, and the, usually the, the bargain is pretty high. There are two things which are usually overlooked, but these are the, the important things which kill uh, the processes. This, one is the selectivity. You do not need um, high selectivity if you go to fuels or even for commodities, you can have this. But if you go to fine chemicals, it had to be unique or ex uh, explicit selectivity, especially if you go to, to pharmaceuticals. Um, then you cannot afford to have mixtures. Um, and the second part, which is usually the killer of all translation into application is downstream processing. Um, if you go to synthetic, to synthetic fuels, you can afford maximum um, a kind of distillation. If you go to fine chemicals here, you, you can afford like a, the, the Bayer process to finally really known um, uh, column chromatography um, um, moving chiral beds or something like this. But but this is depending on the, on the product. And it, if this is an in the, a simple molecule, then you cannot afford a lot of things. Therefore, uh, it's also the menu for today. I will tell you a little bit of higher performance oxidizers, but also some, some uh, fine chemicals applications. And, and when it starts to pay off, we put this together in, in the, this kind of um, uh, paper. Um, if you believe in things like, like chemical engineering use, um, it's inherently safe because if you switch off the electricity, the reaction immediately ceases. This is for, um, especially for oxidation is very important. You have no thermal runaway reactions. You do not need some uh, rare elements or resources because you bring in electrons, you take them out. There's no reagent waste, but also activated by the electron um, hole you generate or you add, a, uh, you make a bond labile because you add an electron. Um, you can be more reactive than, than lithium or fluorine, but this is in most cases not necessary. The important thing is that you have a shortcut of many steps and you generate new or create new IP space. This is an important thing for, for companies nowadays. What can we do with that? Almost, um, yeah, we, we just use it the same container. We have a two electrode arrangement, um, what we have here. And um, if you think about how much electricity you, you need, then you see about, it, it's about, um, yeah, even in nowadays, it's a pound, point 0.4 to six euro cents uh, per molar conversion. This is almost equivalent to a dollar uh, um, euro. Um, and, and this is the assumption that it's 
relatively conductive and you need two electrons for construction uh, of a bond. And this translates, of course, depending on the size of the uh, molecule to 0.5 to 6 kilowatt hours per kilogram product. That means electricity is not the limiting factor. Uh, what can we do with that? Of course, oxidation and reduction is almost trivial, um, but it also generates radicals. And these radicals can be used for radical reactions or sequences. Uh, or you use the basicity of the system here. Um, and of course, um, we are synthetic organic chemists. That means we are not so much interested at the current voltage curve. That means we want to accumulate a product. And it could be that the product is eaten up by the counter electrode or by the same electrode on a different time scale. And that's something you have to look on. And therefore, the, the following up reactions is, is very important. And you have to look at the reversibility. You have to design the following up reactions as well. There are virtually only three ways to, to operate an electrode directly. That means inert material. Then this is a very um, important if you want to control the reaction later on by solvent effects, for example. And then you use this one here, or you have the specific reactivity, which is not possible by simple electron transfer. And you have a catalyst on the surface, or you have a reagent you regenerate. This is similar, like like enzymatic uh, reactions where you have a cofactor. Um, if you want to scale it up later on to large quantities, then A and B is strongly preferred. But sometimes you cannot avoid the the, the, the approach C. Um, it's very important that not everything happens on the electrode. Uh, usually, it's, it's talked that everything happens on the electrode. Organic radicals are quite stable. We call this on the left side here, that's the ticket to the party. If you have no electron transfer, nothing happens. Therefore, this is very important, but you can screw up on, on the party. That means you don't make it to the final end. And therefore, there are many parameters involved here, um, which in, in um, direct by the uh, catalysis or inert electrode materials, potential or over potential, which gives you already some selectivity. But on the other side, you have some intermediates which have some following up reactions. For example, some of them which are easier transformed than the initial, initial one. And then you, you can control this by the supporting light, electrolyte or ionic strengths. Of course, there's some uh, um, parameters which are on both sides very important, like the current density, which controls the concentration of the radicals you have in the uh, space equivalent close to the electrode. The important point here is definitely you need both sides. None of them is more important. If you control both of them, then, then you will make it. Um, how do we approach that? We use screening. We use product-driven screening. There's an stuff you, you, you can build your own, but you can also buy that from, from a company. This is the amount of getting a lot of electrolysis done, but in a very precise way that you can use the, these data later on on a more advanced uh, screening techniques and even for optimization, like design of experiments and machine learning. We have usually different electrode materials since they're similar uh, dimensions. You can easily implement them. Different electrode sy electrolyte systems, you can think about almost infinite number. But what we use here, uh, because of the, the application later on, something which is compatible with wastewater and other things. Therefore, we have a set of five to eight, which usually does the job. And we directly looked into the system if the product uh, accumulates. This is also used for our optimization. And therefore, um, this is the, the, the backbone. Um, this is the one which is in, uh, we had before. This was the, the, the divided cell. You see the, the, the undivided cells, eight of them are one magnetic stirrer. And yet, then you can have uh, different cells later on for getting larger quantities. In most cases, we directly go from the screening system to the larger cell. And this is scaling factor of 300. And then you have a 200 gram product directly in one electrolysis. And this gives you enough material to carry on the synthesis later on. If you go to larger quantities, there's no way out that you have flow cell, which is usually the smallest device of the whole system. And then you pump overnight it to a container where you do discontinuously the workup. This is a typical so-called kilo lab equipment you need here. That means at the very beginning, you do screening. And if you have the screening done, then you decide if you go to a batch type version, which is fine for kilogram or something like this. If you need larger quantities, then, then you go usually stepwise to larger flow cells, which um, allows you a quite huge scaling. This is the largest cell we operate, which goes up to five uh, kilowatt uh, consumption. But then you have to cool, of course, in the system. And there, there should be a need for that as well. 
let's come to the first topic. Um, um, it's not really organic on the first side, but, but it's, uh, it's about water electrolysis. And you know what electrolysis, everybody thinks about that at, uh, at the moment. Why do we need that? The uh, future um, industry has to switch, of course, um, which comes from the biomass as well. But then we have a lot of biomass is often quite highly functionalized with OH and other things. We have to get rid of that. It was really nicely explained by Catalan where we need hydrogen just to use that um, to get rid of the stuff, even for carbon capture, this will be used. Therefore, especially for um, uh, ammonia, but also refining stuff and making steel, these are the major uh, areas where you need definitely the, 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 the hydrogen. And um, of course, you make also a lot of chemicals. The question is, uh, do we need it maybe for, for uh, running cars? And if you go a little bit deeper in that, and you'll see if you go to, from wheel to wheel, that means if you make the stuff, the electricity, and then use it for a car, the battery might be more efficient because you lose only almost half of it of the energy. If you intercept in between the hydrogen, then you lose much, much more. And, and therefore, keep that in mind for mobility, most likely it will be used the electricity directly or by a, by a battery, but maybe not, not in hydrogen. Okay, the, um, the hydrogen is, is nice, it's sexy, everything is fine, but the problem starts with oxygen. You have to make the oxygen, but is, is there value for that? Um, of course you release it, it's a train of energy because here the problem starts, the over potentials are high and most anodes are quite costly, like if you need iridium oxide. Are there some alternative anodic reactions? And this is the key and what we talk about today, a little bit about that. It has to be scalable. It has to be versatile. Something not a unique reaction will be useful. And maybe you make a high performance oxidizer, which is storable. And you can, of course, have to be circular economy. Otherwise, you, there will be no use out of them. And, and can you make elaborate molecules? It's not making maybe... Uh, methanol and, and oxidize it further to something. It, it's important that you make really, really real life molecule, which is for example, for pharmaceutical industry or something else. And therefore this closes, brings it down to, to maybe per iodates, peroxysulfates or peroxycarbonates. I, I will talk today only about one of them, but, but we work on all of them at the moment. Uh, well, why is this important? Sometimes you make this conversion or try to do this electrochemically. The problem is then in between, it does not work because this is easier uh, transformed to the, and you end up in a different um, uh, pathway. And, and therefore this is not a way to do it directly on the electrode. Sometimes, especially for complex molecules, this could happen. This is what we call usually, this is the in-cell, everything in, in one container, we make the electrolysis and the X-cell that means that we generate a reagent or something like this and separate off, for example, the hydrogen. And then we, we just uh, drop it to our reaction mixture and, and make the conversion. This provides much higher yield. It's milder. You know, this um, typical oxidizer, you know, like, like, uh, like bleach or chlorine or oxone are generated by this way. But I, I want to go to the, something which is really much versatile and uh, which is loved by organic chemists. It's a pair iodate. Pair iodate is really, really interesting. Usually pair iodate is, is generated on electrochemically on lead dioxide um, anodes. They inter, in this, uh, disintegrate over time. <laughs> that means makes it uh, not really a green process because here you have the problem that the lead um, ions are in there. You have a corrosion and uh, we develop something where you can start directly from iodide, the simplest iodine source and making eight electron oxidation. Then you end up with, with the um, power up per iodate, and, and this is a very clean and scalable way. And then the bond of diamond electrode is a calm electrode, which is ultra stable. And the, you can use the, the per iodates for almost everything. That means uh, if you convert um, especially car, um, carbohydrate uh, to, to aldehydes and other things, even food processing, it would be interesting. The challenge is you need it in a really, for sensitive application like food and, and a drug, you need a very good quality where the lead is removed. And this is often a problem. Therefore, it was prohibitive to use it um, uh, usually for the sensitive applications. Resolve that um, uh, to show you that we use directly this divided cell, this is Teflon stuff, which is the ICA screening system. And, and we needed about 82 experiments in total 
to figure out what are the, the best conditions. And um, to make the long story short, we start with uh, sodium um, iodide, which is the cheapest source of, uh, of sodium. And then we have a sol uh, concentration range and we need about 10 times the, the amount of, of caustic soda. Uh, that's the important part. Why is this case? Because we made eight uh, oxidation steps and two equivalents of caustic soda will be added on, over the per iodate. And if you do so, then you can see you can use high current densities. And the important thing is, if you have the correct ratio, then it's quite high, uh, highly reproducible and yields up to 97%. And it turned out that bond of diamond is much, much, much more superior to over lead, lead oxides, in even stabilized systems, uh, graphite, classic carbon, and, and nickel oxide uh, surface protected systems. Therefore, it, it, it's really, really amazing um, the difference this, this electrode makes. If you go to the um, um, a flow system, then you need, of course, it, it, you have different parameters which come in there. Then you need uh, some more uh, uh, optimization. We used here once more design of experiment. And uh, you see many things are the same. Even in, in, the, in, in flow, you get a, a good yield. And you can see why you need so much um, uh, caustic soda. If you don't have enough, then you see directly um, um, iodine is precipitating and it stops. If you electrolyze it here with enough caustic soda up to 4F, it, 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 everything is in solution and then it starts precipitating it, but you electrolyze further the, the suspension and uh, then you end up in a suspension with fine, fine, fine crystals of per iodate and this can be filtered off later on. And it's you can not only start with, with sodium iodide, you can use all other sources, different iodine sources, even um, iodate, which comes out of the, the uh, system for, from the catalysis. Therefore, even organic iodates uh, would be possible here as well. Then you go to larger cells. Here we just, uh, because we did the set of the data were already there, they would just uh, uh, do a variation of a single uh, parameter, and uh, but still you need for large cells and, 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 and robust uh, work in, in, in scaling uh, a certain amount of experiments, but this was sufficient. And then you see we went up even to higher current densities, and this is a way to go even to kilogram scale. Um, therefore, um, this is a way to have enough material there. And, and there will be pretty soon a, a paper uh, wrapping up the, the, the reactor system, which is important to make this an, an, in a way that you have no clogging in the system here as well. But what can we do with that? And what is the driving force for that? And this was a collaboration with, with, with Graz. <laughs> Therefore, today, the, the, the talk is almost perfect, which was before. And uh, um, with our colleague, uh, Katrin Winkler from, from Graz, um, there was a, a way to, to make Make the most efficient levetiracetam synthesis. Levetiracetam is this drug here. It's, it's the most prominent one um, against the uh, uh, epilepsy. And it's a generic drug. Therefore, the costs have to be pretty low. You start here directly to do the um, uh, um, um, amino nitrile system by condensation. And the water from the condensation is also used by enzymes, which are um, uh, made by uh, um, yeah, um, genetically engineering. Uh, different ways we uh, exploit here, modern ways, and then you, you can install um, after no, the, the chirality in a unique way because you have a dynamic racemization and the hydration and the oxidation later on. You can do this electrochemically with mediators like Shen styled it, but then you have a corrosion or, or erosion of the, the EE. We don't have this because we make the, the, the rosidium catal catalysis here, and then it preci you precipitate off the sodium iodate, which goes back and, and can be used once more uh, in, due to an XL regeneration here. The yield is quite high, and, and the EE is extremely high here as well. This is one example. The other example, what you can do here as well is that you use uh, sulfinimines here and then you oxidize them further and then you get um, um, the sulfoxamines, especially cyano uh, with one are the ones which have an important uh, um, uh, significance if you use them in uh, as a high, yeah, 
um, high performance uh, systems in pesticide business, uh, especially against specific insects or medical applications. And here you see both steps were done electrochemically and uh, you do not need any strong basis uh, terminal oxidizers. Therefore, it's an extremely green way uh, to the sulfenimines and sulfoxamines. There will be much more, even lignin degradation will be shown pretty soon. Um, I, I don't want to bore you to death here. Therefore, we, we, we just wrap it up a little bit in that way that you, you can use that which comes out of the uh, system is, um, for catalysis. And this is an Excel uh, version. It's a platform uh, chemistry we have here. And even traces of APIs are destroyed because the the conditions at the electrolysis in, in the anodic compartment are very uh, harsh and therefore you just mineralize the organic material. Um, now, now we switch a little bit gears. We are still uh, working with something. Can we make an upcycling of electrochemical upcycling of pollutants? And one molecule I fall in love recently is um, SO2, everybody works with CO2. We have a look at SO2. And it's, it's the most important pollutant in flow gas after CO2. We remove that. That's the reason why we have a gypsum. We, we make that it's inexpensive. There's no gypsum anymore mined because you have so much from flue gas treatment. Sometimes it's used to, to make sulfuric acid. It has, in, when I was young, we have the acidic rain, which is luckily not anymore there. But the important thing is that it, the features of SO2 are intriguingly high. It's, it's quite polar and it's easy to liquefy and it dissolves organic and inorganic materials. And it has a relatively interesting dielectric constant. Therefore, it should be perfect. And the cost scenario for SO2 is because we have more than we need, it's quite inexpensive. Even if you want to have something which is not so, uh, you, uh, not so um, uh, you need something anhydrous, then it's on the, on the same level than other solvents you, you buy. That means five euro per kilogram. If you want to buy it and if you have a winery area, like, like I'm sitting at the moment, then you get it from the Home Depot even. But the electrochemical part is very interesting. If you look at that, the, and, and the, in the cathodic regime, there's almost, even if you have protons there, there's no hydrogen evolution. It directly reduces the SO2. And then you have a large area where you can go for uh, oxidations, almost four volts, which is in incredible. Therefore, you need this very strange uh, supporting electrolytes to see that. But this is the, the way to go. I think uh, it's very interesting. Can we use that? for making another conversion with organic molecules. And uh, the, the question is, how can we use SO2? There are, I think, three different sugar gates you can have at the moment, DAPSO, quite expensive still um, uh, for, for, for our group. Then the, the so-called meta bisulfate here in the middle, it's inexpensive, but it's literally a rock. You cannot dissolve this. Uh, except uh, water, and and therefore um, this is you, you cannot use that. And there's, there's some new developments from from China, but unfortunately, you need a, this extremely heavy, and and you lose a lot of material uh, to get the SO2. There's a simpler solution, and the solution is that you you can buy it in in dichloromethane or THF, but both of them have the disadvantage. If you want to use that, they have high vapor pressure. It's the best way is that you have an acetonitrile. The vapor pressure is not so high, and you can have even a seven molar solution, and this 45 weight percent of SO2 is that, and you can easily store that in the fridge and use syringes. And therefore, this is the, the perfect way to use it. When we started that, we it turned out that the if you oxidize arenes and you have alcohols in there with SO2 and, and base, you try to directly get the, these compounds. Um, then you get the alkyl aryl sulfonate, interesting compounds. But the more interesting part uh, is this one here. If you have amines directly in, in the presence, it's a multi-component reaction, directly electrolyze that, add with these bond of diamond electrodes, and then, then you will see you end up with sulfonamides. And this is there's no precedence in, in classical conventional chemistry. That's the first time this was made directly. But just to outline it to you, this is the traditional way we teach our students. You'd make a chlorosulfonation here that you do that. This is a little bit nasty. You get isomeric mixtures, uh, which is common to, to the installation of this uh, moiety. And then you uh, uh, displace this and make accomplish the, the sulfonamides. 
There's a direct way with catalysis. Of course, you need a leaving group. By the way, this is uh, most cases more expensive than, than all of the other compounds. And you need a lot of things, which is a good way, but maybe not a perfect one. If you look, um, Tim Noel did uh, recently something. We started with salt, uh, did this uh, um, tiles, and, and then they oxidized that directly. Uh, but, but keep in mind, if you know how technically tiles are made, most of them were made by direct reduction of this one to this one here. Therefore, uh, it, there could be a different way and we did it directly. And there, there's no way to, to stress um, why they are important. You find them in pharmaceuticals everywhere because they have a similar properties like, like the, the amides, but they're not prone to, to hydrolysis and, 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 and stay a little bit tighter to the pockets anyway. Okay, uh, when we started that, um, we, of course we have all the isomeric mixture, but this is since it's an unprecedented way, we found a way to even to, to find that uh, we can work even on classic carbon electrodes. The yield seems to be the same, but on the long term, the stability of the bond of diamond electrode is much better and you have no falling on the surface. And that's the way why we use that and, and prefer to bond of diamond electrodes. You see that the installation of the group really works. Um, you have the final product. I don't want to um, um, put it on under the carpet. We have isomeric mixtures, but if you put it together for direct process, this is quite nicely. Uh, we have different arenes, what we can use. Of course, it has to be electron rich. Uh, Pyridines don't work in this way. Um, the important thing is that you can have also on the other way, different um, um, amines and if you have the different amines so you can use them here as well and uh, with the morpholine we even made this a uh, scale up um, 13 fold scale up and then you see even the yield went up and it's a very simple H type class cell and uh, by one shot you get directly almost two grams of the, of the product. I think this is a quite robust way and you can directly work that we use the same uh, electrolyte here on, on both say, sides because it's well conducted. How does it work? And this, this is the important point that we have here, especially uh, we oxidize the arene and, and the SO2 uh, comes together with the amine and they make a um, Lewis acid, Lewis base adduct. And, and this rearranges to this uh, metosulfinate and this just adds to the system and that we only get the um, attacked by the sulfur and not by the other hydroatoms. We have some um, um, hydrogen bonding active compounds in there. A hexafluor isopropanol is added here. You will see later on why this is very important. And the second oxidation is very simple and, and it furnishes the more stable product, which you see here. Uh, the final product is quite stable. Uh, and even the intermediate here, uh, we, even anionic is not prone to oxidation. Um, the, the starting materials are much easier to oxidize the arenes. What's the, what is the next step? And next step is, is of course, it's that you, that you have two um, nitrogens in there. The sulfamides is the urea equivalent with, of sulfur. And um, if you looked at it, it's a kind of emerging topic at the moment it, in, in uh, pharmaceutical industry or even in agrochemistry. And then you see how is this usually done if you have not two electron rich systems then you can work with sulfur chloride otherwise this directly oxidizes it there's the best way up to date was um the rutkovich from the later rutkovich um uh, he used a large amount of acid 2 and uh, unfortunately also a large amount of iodine uh, this was uh, uh, and when you work with acid 2 fluorogates it becomes a quite expensive uh, method and when and our system works with a catalytic amount of iodine and a small amount of SO2, not much excess. And, and therefore you will see this is very, very easy to handle. I want to show you today the, the, the two arenes we use here, the symmetrical one here. Uh, when we figured out the conditions, uh, to make the long story short, we, we need an iodine source. We used here 10 mole percent of the um, of organic iodide to have it uh, well soluble. And we, we need a divided cell. And, and uh, by this way, you, you need a certain amount of acetonitro and HFIP. Um, if you deviate that, then you end up with traces. It's very important. You need the hydrogen bonding system HFIP, but too much of that will kill the process. And that's the essence of, of this table. 
And you see that the yield is, is quite okay, um, almost quantitative conversion and the isolated yield almost 90%. That's something that's not organic chemists, synthetic chemists, you're fine with that. Um, it, it's possible that you modify at the ends of the anilines quite easily different moieties are there, electron rich, electron uh, poor stuff works, even if benzocaine could be implemented here as well. And then you have some other substituents here as well. And once more, it, it, it's scalable, it's possible. Let's come a little bit, I have a look at the, at the mechanism, why we need a specific amount of HFIP. Um, we have the same situation. Um, we have the, the, this, this kind of uh, um, charge transfer complex, and this ends up in the amido sulfonate. The HFIP catalyzes that, it promotes to go in this direction. And then you oxidize the iodine, and then this one is stabilized first. And this promotes as well by hydrogen bonding the formation to this uh, sulfonyl iodide here. And by this way, you go in this way. And, and if you look at the Rutkevich system, um, I think maybe he, he claimed to have this, but if, if you look at that and you use the same hydrogen bonding system, the Rutkevich protocol is also strongly propelled in one direction. And this is also published pretty soon. Therefore, the hydrogen or the solvent direction is, is the key behind everything. You see this quite, quite nicely. If, if you have the SO2 amine, a complex, then you see this charge transfer version, and soon you, the h is added, it's instantaneously, you have a decolorization uh, to this honey type color here. And you see this as well by, by the CV data, the product is very, very stable. And of course, you first oxidize the iodine, of course, you can, can go for, further, because then you have the um, um, I3 minus version, which can be also oxidized, but this is the dominant process. And of course, the, the other ones are not oxidized un, under these conditions as well. Therefore, SO2, I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a very powerful solvent. You can do a lot of things and it's, it's really magic. There are a lot of things which are completely underappreciated in my opinion. Let's come to, to, to something which is, um, in, in my eyes, and very, it's, a, it's kind of a diamond what we did. Um, uh, this was is a, is a collaboration with, with a colleague from, from ATH Zurich. And it's a, the, the shuttle cam. He is famous, Bill Morandi is famous for, for his shuttle chemistry. That you have two groups, you bring it on another double bond, and it's uh, usually a reversible way. And uh, by, if you want to do that, uh, um, it usually works with many things, but not with halogens. If you do that, uh, it would be really, really great because if you can do that, then you, you do not need chlorine or bromine. Chlorine, you get it in a cylinder, but if you have bromine in your stock room, you see this is corrosive. It, the container will fall apart pretty, pretty soon. And it, it's a pain and it's quite expensive at the moment if you have to buy it because of the shipment and the regulations. It would be much, much easier if you have a solvent of which is easier to, to store um, and easier to handle. And, and the point behind that, why it did not work with the classical way by metal catalysis is, if you do that, um, usually you have a, um, an, a strongly favored uh, pathway is that you have the, if the metal is there, then you have the uh, better hydrogen elimination here. And that means that you take this out here definitely, and, and, and you end up with a vinyl system, yeah, but you do not take out both, both groups. And that's, that's the difference here definitely. If you work um, in this direction, you almost don't find that. This is so strongly promoted that you only find this one, but this is important for the shuttle system. And the, the idea which came along uh, when, when a co-worker of mine, Johannes Ruckel, visited um, uh, Bill, um, that by electrochemistry, you can do this. It, this is a consecutive paired electrolysis. And, and the, the, the good stuff is you, you just first kick out the, uh, the, the halogens here, and, and then you have the double bond system, and then you transfer it over another system and another double bond system. And uh, over the under the line, you have a shuttle system. And therefore, it was called the E shuttle system. Um, uh, you, you see, this is relatively versatile. Also, here a little bit of A trip and, and simple graphite electrodes are in, 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 and even in larger. Um, versions are there, um, can be used, and it's a really, really inexpensive uh, carbon material you can use here. 
And this is versatile that you have different groups here. Uh, even if you have more double bonds, this could be made that you get in this more or less selectively in a very good way. And, and therefore this is, uh, for, for bromine, it's very easy. You do not need any kind of additional metal. This is a little bit different if you have the, the chlorine system. Something what, what Song Ling also found out that you need a little bit more on, on that on that point that you um, uh, for the chlorination on on the anodic part in manganese and D two was also used here that you can use the, the very simple um, dichloroethane which is a the, the base chemical or the commodity which is behind the PVC uh, chemistry and then you can do this to you generate here ethylene which goes off and, and you see you have a broad variety of course is what the most work of the of the co-workers to do that but it's extreme versatile chemistry and uh, I think the, the the ball breaking use which came along was definitely that you can use even some waste or something which is a pollutant that's something we use liberately and from the 50s up from from the 50s to the to the end of the um, 70s even in the 80s um, this was done on a large large scale you could buy this even at the end of the 90s uh, 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 this is was useful against ants and many insects but the problem is you have a lot of stuff which is in in the soil especially where this was a deposit and if you use that you you have almost quantitative conversion and you convert this to benzene and on the other side you you get the dichlor compound and this even works if you mix that with soil and even if you have a road soil or farmland soil you see even it's a small amount you, you get a, a conversion therefore um the out there many large amount of deposits for that that could be used for something useful here as well. Therefore, I, I think this is a, a really, really something uh, very good uh, a finding which could even help the, the electrochemistry help the, the, um, our society that, to clean up sites. Now let's come to, to the last part, which is the, the corrodic corrosion. And that's something you, you find almost everywhere. You find this, uh, if you go in, 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 in pharmaceuticals, you find the, the, the three membered ring systems. Um, even if the data are a little bit, um, yeah, not very uh, updated, but you, it's almost the same. Roughly 10% of the new uh, APIs are, um, contain the cyclopropanes. You find them almost everywhere. And, and especially where our collaborator had this kind of um, target and his his um, actual compound had this building blocks several times in a molecule. And the question was how could to make this to make this on ten tons? And the, the way was that you start with hydroxyproline, you protect this, you oxidize that, and and then you do the olefination and the carbene addition. And then this is the one which is easily crystallized and purified. And then the question was, can we do the reduction? Um, there were several providers in in, in China who did the birch reduction. There could be a resumization here, unfortunately, a ring opening as well. And the, the yield, the best yield was 65% and all runs were different outcome. This is a no-go for FDA approval. And the one way was that you have a hydrogenolysis, uh, but you end up also with, with opening up the system as well. And the yield is not very high. And, and the purification was not perfect. And the question was, can we do this electrochemical? Usually we are last man standing. That means if something not working, they come to us and, and have a question, can you help us? And we were pleased, even under acidic condition, the, the bulk group stays in, and you, then you remove stepwise one bromine after the other one, and the cyclopropane, no racemization, no ring opening, but <laughs> we lost a lot of um, metal in here. We used the lead electrode here, and this partially dissolved. And that's something which is a very dark spot on the cathodic reduction. Um, um, I think that this tells you that's a little bit like the, the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, more or less. Uh, oh, you see, metal is dissolving, and, and this is a, a, is a problem. Indeed, that the radicals click on the surface and pull out the, the, the metal. And we, we tried to put that together. This is something which was known since 120 years, but uh, it's almost ignored by most electrosynthesis guys. And we, we tried to bring this back to the people um, for the uh, cover page, we had to remove the skulls. <laughs> this was too dramatic, but it, this is fine. Okay, what goes wrong? This pulls out, especially for lead and, 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 and other metals which have a higher overproduction of hydrogen. And the question is, what can we do here? And 
the way what we uh, go here is that we have a protective layer. This is sometimes possible if you have a tunneling of electrons. This, this is implemented in the BSF process. Novel ca cathodic material, very, very difficult. Or you just stabilize the, the metal as an alloy. And this is the key, uh, which was found more or less by serendipity. In this pro project, we tested different things and, and turned out that leaded prongs, it's a copper matrix, a little bit of tin in there. Otherwise it, it makes a demixing of the, of the lead. And then you have a comparable quality like lead and it's mechanically stable and it's not too expensive. You see that partially eaten up in the electrolysis, this stays there. And therefore um, leaded prongs is, seems to be something specific. Even if you looked at the yield goes up, it's, it's now almost 90%. We pushed that to almost quantitative conversion and it, the, the toxic trace metals was almost exclusively a copper. And then we scaled it up. In, 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 in a cell, which provides you at least for one shot, 25 grams, but, but this is not, not scalable for 10 tons. They need flow cells. And we were able to do that. And by single pass, 98%. And um, um, we just misused some old HPLC pumps here. It's also possible to have more complex molecules that you transferred, and then you're able to make the cyclopropanes uh, by this way, and the enzyme might survive this dehydrogenation process. When we did this, it turned out that the, um, um, in, in the books, you see that leather prongs should be a homogeneous uh, alloy. When we drill holes in that by lasers, then you see that the, it's not on the surface pattern, but below that you have uh, uh, domains with copper rich and especially lead rich systems. That means you need the lead rich for the first conversion and the copper rich for the second conversion. And therefore, um, I think you cannot find this by the, the design. This is something which underlines the power of the uh, screening system. And the letter prongs can be used for a reduction of a lot of things you will see here. Um, you can make even triazoles. They usually made by this way here that you uh, try to, to implement the nitrogen here and then close this or do the R relation. Um, often you have to struggle with, with, with a different isomeric mixture. Um, and then you have to separate it off. And there would be a, a reduction of the nitro would be one possibility. It's already known in literature, but, but it's very specific systems. And even electrochemical, this was known, but here you use perchlorate. And if you look at it a little bit more deeply, then it's potentially static. And most examples needed 64F. That means you have an, it's, it's brute force with a lot of electricity to, to go in this direction, but only a few examples were there and not much diversity about the different moieties. And there was a very old one with a single example here as well. And the question is, can we use it as a practical method? And by screening, you find directly out it's possible. And then you see the letter prongs, they have different additives you need. That's a little more uh, alkaline system, but it directly works um, in, in, in methanol or even aqueous methanol. And by this way, you can work directly here to see the ring closure. You get selectively these one here. Sometimes it works not that good if you have, uh, for example, something which could be over-reduced, but all the other ones work quite nicely. And you can stop it in time. That means if you have the anoxide here, if you want to have this, and then you even have the, the IOTA system well accessible. Here, the important thing is that you stop it in time that you know how much electricity you need for the system. That it goes much further. This is something uh, where you show that some catalysis could be replaced directly by electrolysis. Look at this. This is something which is done in industry. You have the cyanamide. Um, and, and then you try to reduce this as a building block. This is something which is often used and you need a lot of palladium on, on, on charcoal. This is quite a lot of stuff you need in because the problem is this is usually contaminated with sulfur, which poisons the catalyst over time. And the question is, can we do it electrochemically? And then maybe something which is uh, transition metals, which are quite inexpensive. Uh, in a way, or we do not need this kind of noble um, elements anymore. When you did this in, 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 um, um, in batch, it turned out nick porous nickel was the best. Even palladium was really not good. Um, um, when we were looking to, to, to our dear colleague, uh, Lutz Ackermann, we were looking, thinking about cobalt, but, but it 
this was not doing the job and we're pleased that the, the nickel did it and porous nickel was even a little bit better on, on the long-term uh, performance. And it turned out um, sodium acetate was also working. And when you go further, then you see, okay, um, you have the cyanamide, which could be reduced and, and the electrolyte, it's, it, it's possible that, that it can work easily here. You need a flow cell, which has a foam electrode. And this is quite the, the, the ICA cell. And then you just add the, the, the gasket here, which, which allows to, to, to put in the, the, the foam material. And then this goes, this looks to the other side where you have the separator. And, and, and here you have the, the foam in between. And by this way, and this is the, the important essence here, in better electrolysis, you get higher yields, but by, by flow electrolysis, the yield is not so high because, but this is obtained by crystallization. That means here you don't need any kind of supporting electrolyte additionally. You just do the electrolysis here. And this makes it uh, very interesting because later on you just take the mother liquor, enrich it once more and elect elect electrolyze it further. And the important thing is nickel, Electrified color tolerates a lot of uh, things which usually kills a catalyst, uh, especially also nickel. But here, if it's electrified, sulfur makes not a problem at all, and it's the whole system survives. Um, I have really the beauty that I have very talented co workers. Um, these are the heroes. Um, um, they, I mentioned their chemistry and um, um, the, the um, these are the older heroes here, Johannes Röckel, the, 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 the uh, e-shuttle stuff. And uh, here, this is the team with the uh, SO2 uh, stuff. And, 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 and here, Martin Klein did a lot of stuff here as well. Of course, we have collaborators, otherwise we, we cannot do that. And the important thing is, of course, you need some, some money for that. Uh, a lot of come from DFG, but also from our um, companies which are involved. And there's one company I founded three years ago, and uh, uh, which is devoted to, to custom synthesis and especially B2B business, which is not possible anymore at the university. I'm thankful to be here. Thanks for, for, to the audience still being there, not falling asleep. Thanks a lot, and uh, I'm, I'm ready to take some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for this very uh, exciting talk and for all these insights. Um, so let's start. Uh, let me check the Q&A box. So there's one uh, question from Renal Vera. I, I hope I pronounced it correctly. So how one can choose a pair of electrodes while designing a new electrochemical reaction? Um, yeah. It, it, Usually there's some all-rounder electrodes like, like, like um, graphite. Uh, if you have absolutely no clue, um, they, then you have to look in, in the textbooks. Uh, I think this is one of the things where a lot of um, educated guests comes, uh, comes in, especially if, if you need um, a metal activity on, on the surface. But often you, you find effects which are not easily predictable. We see that as well by screening that some electrodes you do not anticipate at the very beginning, they outperform all other ones. Um, therefore, um, there's no simple answer to that. Um, usually have a look if similar reactions have been done, go to the typical textbooks and, and, and then test them and, and use the, 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 the carbon electrodes. Um, keep in mind, graphite is not graphite. That there are 500 different uh, versions out there, um, different SP2, SP3 ratio, and of course, metal impurities are also sometimes in there, which makes the difference. Okay, so thanks. Um, so uh, I'm going to continue with one question. I'm particularly interested uh, in this uh, periodate uh, generation, this electrochemical one. And um, so you have shown uh, that this works very efficiently and, and that the application afterwards proceeds uh, in all the examples Excel. So, so you, you uh, use this reagent externally. Uh, so, so some people are interested in in-cell processes, as you know, and, and the question is, have you tried an in-cell process? I think a good example would be a, a cleavage of diodes. Is this possible or as an electrocatalytic mm. system? Uh, they, they, some of them are just described, one by Hans Schaefer many years ago, and, and some other com um, from companies, from, from Japanese groups as well. And uh, they use usually uh, osmium or ruthenium and, and paradate, put everything in there. 
we tested it uh, as well for, for the levator acetam at the very beginning. We wanted to do it in an in in-cell version. And it turned out if you do that, um, you do not oxidize the pair iodate or make, do not make the pair iodate, you oxidize the, the, the metal species in, in most cases. And um, I think this is the, the problem. If you want to have an efficient production of the pair iodate, you need quite extreme potentials at the BDD electrode and this kills organic molecules. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. So, so are there any, so Adam, uh, do you have a question? Yes, I have. I have actually two questions <laughs> if I can ask. So first of all, thank you for this fantastic talk. Uh, my first question is, if it comes to the yields, um, I assume you calculate the yields starting from the substrates and you don't think so much about the Faradaic efficiencies or what is the, how should we look at this? I mean, yeah. you're not any chemist. That's no, 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 no. That's nothing bad about that, okay? <laughs> There's only one chemistry, okay? And there, therefore, um, there are two things you have. To, if you're an industrial person, you have to, to look on two things. One of the Faradaic efficiency, and the second one is the applied voltage, not the potential. What you have to pay at the very end. This is the important number. And uh, if you look at that, then, then you will see usually the, the energy efficiency in most processes, if you're very lucky, it will be about 45 to 50%. Then you're really lucky. In most cases, it's about 20 to 25%. Uh, for the, if you go to extreme potentials, like, like, like with the uh, pair iodate, the current efficiency is about 40% or something like this. The electro efficiency is half of it. That, 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 that's the number. But under this regime, if you just think about fine chemicals, um, um, the, the, the costs, if you can do this in, in, in a circular way, uh, much less, unless you have to compare this to the conventional system, where right, to depose materials. And in the worst case that you have to get rid of um, metal salts. Thank you. Uh, one more question, if I may ask Robert, yeah? Um, of course, go ahead. Uh, so, secret, I also like building reactors, actually, and I must admit, I never saw a talk where somebody disclosed so much of a cell design. So I think this is fantastic for the community. Uh, I just have a question. How long does it take to get the cell design right? How many months or years? Or how long did it take you to, to get to this, this kind of level of a scale-up, actually? I think for, this, for the scale-up, you have to invest a lot of stuff in pumps and, and different pumps and, and other stuff. I, I think I think Robert made, made the same experience. If you start with, with a flow cell, um, if the flow cell becomes bigger, it's more tailor-made for the process you're studying. There's no, what we call in Germany, the, 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 the um, uh, multi-purpose uh, Swiss knife version. Uh, that, that's not there, and unfortunately, because you need to replace the electrodes or something like this. Therefore, um, there's, there's some rules how to, how to design something like this. Um, um, what we use often is narrow gap. Um, if this is possible, because then the distance between the, the electrodes is uh, 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 rather short, and then you can save in, in the applied voltage later on. This is what industry also does. Therefore, we, 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 have, we take profit out of stuff which is published by industry as well uh, in, in the past years. Um, if you can go into this direction, I think you can, if you have a machine shop, even some people work with a 3D printer, but if you go to something which is, has to be chemical resistant, 3D printing might be difficult um, still at the moment. Therefore, a good machine shop. And, and then I think most of the guys who publish that, they have in the supporting information, even the, the plans or even the CAD files, how, how, to, how to make the, the, this kind of systems. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks again for the talk. Yeah, welcome. Shub, you have a question? Yes, Rob. Okay, I please have, go ahead. I have several questions, but I, I, try, I will try to limit. So thank you, Segi, for a very inspiring lecture. So I learned a lot. As you know, that we don't work on the electrochemistry, so our knowledge is basically very trivial level. So maybe my question could sound very stupid type. So my first question is, like, throughout the slides, I have seen different current density for different reactions. So how do you basically fix the current density or how, how do you change? What, what is the parameter that you need to look for to fix that current density? Mm, um, 
the reason why we work with Scalvana static version is that, that the electronic periphery is much easier and you can easily scale up. And um, for organic conversions, current densities usually are in, in, in the range, maybe up to 40, 50 uh, milliamps per square centimeters. Sometimes it couldn't go higher for the sulfoxamines. We, we can go even to, to almost 700 <laughs> without loss of a lot of yield, which is surprising. Um, but in most cases, usually it's smaller because organic molecules, if you go to higher current densities, you just rip off more electrons and then side reactions start. With inorganic stuff, you can often go to much, much higher stuff because the molecule is smaller and then other diffusion coefficients are involved and the, the side reactions are quite limited in most inorganic transformations. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is, uh, Robert, can I ask a second? Please, 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 please. Thank you. So my second question is for you, this e shuttle reaction. For so there, you are transferring two functional group to one alkene. But what happened if you take a butadiene for the diene system? What do you observe? Did you try this kind of system? I think that there's some examples, but they were not in conjugation. And I'm sure Johannes Reutel did this, um, but I, I would make something <laughs> out of the blue, okay? Um, I have to look up. Okay. So I think he's here in the audience. Uh, yeah. He was uh, some, a while ago. Maybe he can comment on that. If not, um, maybe I, uh, Shub, do you have another question or? No, no, I'm fine. So thank you very much, Tiggy, for this uh, very inspiring talk and all these nice discussions. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> So if, if there is no further question, I have another one. I'm, I'm interested in this new uh, SO2 electrochemistry and uh, um, and the mechanism of the cathodic reduction, actually. So so the first uh, question is, have, have you, um, do you have proof for, for, for the product? I forgot how the SO2 radical anion is coupled. And But do you have proof that this is first oxidized prior to hydrogen uh, uh, formation at, at platinum? Yeah, it it, it uh, we. we... I was convinced there would be hydrogen, even if you have hydrogen and, and protons in there, they, they, they should be hydrogen at platinum. And then my, my coworker um, said, no, 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 hydrogen formation is, is in there, uh, but you have a certain coloring of this, uh, um, uh, um, of this SO2 radical anion, and it does not directly make dithionite. And you need a surface to do that. And, and, and this was found in the, Eight of uh, end of the 80s by Knittel. Knittel was, was the first who was looking at in, in, in detail from the more, let's call it, uh, physical chemical aspect. And, and, and the, you, you can easily make this and it has a quite still reductive power that is S2 minus. And, and, but, but in my opinion, it's, it's underestimated. And uh, when I was sending first my student <laughs> um, to, the, to the stock room, to look what the cylinder of SO2 will cost. And, and he was trying to order that our typical chemical providers. And then he came back, oh, this will cost about 800 uh, euros, the cylinder. And I was falling over and I was like, let's, I have to think about that once more. And, and then I went in the evening to have something for the redoing of our house in the, in, in the Home Depot. And I saw the cylinders standing there for the wine makers. And then you could get them for, for 15 euros, okay. Mm. Uh, and, and the quality is almost the same. It's just not the label on it that's uh, with the analysis. And then therefore, uh, it, it, if you go further in that, and it's easy, you don't need a pressure system because if, if you work in acetonitrile, it dissolves quite nicely. Um, and of course, if you go to a rotive up, you have to be careful that because then, then you suck it out. But, but it, it's easy to work with that. Okay, and the second question regarding this, what happens if you don't use a divided cell? So can you use maybe this in a paired process? Um, of Did course. This the, what... the cathodic uh, reaction, I mean, yeah. Yeah, we, 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 this was done. In, in some cases, it works. In some cases, not. Um, um, what, what you... The, the problem, if you do so, then, then of course you have a shuttling and the energy efficiency go, goes down. That's one point. And, then, then, um, and therefore the yield is also mm. uh, orders of magnitude less, okay? 
and then and therefore it, it pays off to have it a uh, separator in, 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 in between and we just when you can use the same concept and then you go even to no2 if you want and, and then you make by this way a nitration that you use nitrite and then you make a electrochemical nitration out of that mm -hmm. uh, um, if this is of interest but at the moment pharmaceutical industry won't want to avoid nitration completely because they are afraid that you have nitroso compounds in there and the nitroso compounds especially the n um, nitroso derivatives um, uh, they, they're so af afraid about that, that that they completely avoid that okay uh, thanks so, so we have two more questions from the audience so Ziggy, nope. if you still yeah. have some time uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Are beyond schedule but but i think uh, we, we can handle this still so there is one question from cedric uh, verelst I hope I pronounced it correctly. So he also thanks you for the interesting talk. And he has a follow-up question uh, regarding the current density discussion we just had. So his question is uh, regarding the reply about the current density. Does working in galvanostatic mode often causes selectivity problems or is this limited? Can this always be solved by simply limiting the current density? Since I assume working potential static with a three electrode system is difficult on large scale. So it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last part is absolutely right. Um, it's much more. It's purely academic. Okay, uh, if you were potential static, but but you just have to stop in time. That's one point. And if you industry is trying to use to maximize the current density, if you have a certain range, maybe don't go to the two highest current densities, even it's very appealing and time wise, and and then you don't have too much because the first compound which is oxidized will be oxidized first and of course you have a depletion that means the last five percent could be difficult but in in most cases if you look at that even the last two three percent um can be converted in most cases the, i think the selectivity issue is most cases not that high and if you're synthetic organic chemist most people are happy with 95 percent yield all right so there's, I hope this answers the question. Uh, I, I think so, yes. And uh, the, the last one, the very, very last one now is from Anup uh, Mandal. Uh, so uh, Anup also thanks for, uh, for the very nice and informative talk. And he has a query regarding the uh, sulfamide synthesis. And he asks, um, is this methodology applicable as well for unsymmetrical sulfamides having two different amine sources uh, by tuning the electronic nature of the molecule? Yes, <laughs> it, it, it's not yet, yet published. On, they have to be different, that the intermediate is stable enough and does not other things. That, that means you, you have to control the reactivity that the first one um, is the one which is so nucleophilic and, and you, the other one is less reactive, but if it is an excess in there and then, and then it works. All right, I think we are done. There's no further question. So uh, I guess uh, it's time to, to wrap up this very interesting session from today. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ziggy once more for his talk. I would actually like to thank both speakers for their contributions. I think it was really, really nice again. Um, so before we switch off our, our um, computers, uh, there's just one last announcement, as, as Adam mentioned in the beginning. So uh, the next SCLS event will happen in November. Uh, so we don't know the date yet. Uh, but uh, we know uh, that Lucia Curie and Bertels will um, uh, give talks. The exact date will be announced soon again, so stay tuned. Uh, we are looking forward to see you all again. Uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, goodbye. Thank you again for the talks, Katharina and Siegfried. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.